Yo, this is DMC and the place to be and the place for all of y'all to be is deconstructing stigma. Welcome to Mindful Things. I'm your host, Trevor Chamberlain. The Mindful Things podcast is brought to you by the Deconstructing Stigma team at McLean Hospital. Help us change attitudes about mental health by visiting deconstructingstigma.org. Okay. Okay. Alrighty then. You are listening to Mindful Things. Yes, you are. You are. You're listening to Mindful Things. I'm your host, Trevor Chamberlain. Welcome new listeners. Welcome returning listeners. On today's episode, I'll be interviewing Rick Walthusen. Rick is an MPP candidate and McCloy Fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. This is pretty amazing. In 2013, Rick founded On The Move EV. Their vision is to create environments where people can openly discuss mental illness Rick and his team have in the last couple of years been bringing their program to Africa in, in both the areas of Kenya and Ghana and a documentary, a short documentary was done on his team and their work there in those locations and uh, we'll include a link to the documentary in the show notes. How's everybody doing? I haven't talked about my cat in a while, have I? It was about a year ago when I was crying on this very podcast about how much I miss my cat because uh, she couldn't stay in the apartment where I was at, the temporary living situation that I had. And uh, she's doing great now. We have a new home, a nice place. She's doing really well. Just took her in for a one-year checkup. She's one pound overweight. Can you believe that crap? One pound it's not so much that I have her on a diet and just I'm watching how she eats. You know, I'm watching the amount and kind of taking and adding, kind of fluctuating, you know, trying to work with her appetite as it fluctuates instead of just loading, a, you know, a standard amount of crunchies in her bowl every morning and every evening. But she's doing really well. They didn't know what age she was when I got her about. She was either three or four when I got her, and that was in 2015. So she's either seven or eight now. And uh, she's become quite a lap cat. And if she doesn't get her lap cat time at night, she gets pretty angry. So when I have to get up, uh, if I want to use the restroom or go refill my water or get a cup of tea or something like that, she, uh, she does not like that. I've been cutting back on cannabis. I have no idea where that came from. In the past four weeks, I've only smoked once. It has nothing to do with the whole uproar over vaping. Uh, That's how I was primarily in taking cannabis was through, well, let me clarify, recreational cannabis. Uh, I was taken in through vaping. Me stopping has nothing to do with that, and I don't plan on quitting. I think I just needed a break. Had cotton brain every day. I don't know. I think my body or brain needs a break. It's all right. (laughs) I don't really care for it. It is what it is. You got to take a break. Too much of uh, anything, you know? I sleep better. I eat less. That's good. Lost some weight. It's an okay thing. Uh, I'm thinking, thinking about exercising again. Careful. I know thoughts like that could actually lead to doing it. But you guys know where I stand on exercise. It's great. It's great for your mental health. I just have no interest in doing it whatsoever. One day, maybe. But I hope you're all doing well. I think the last intro I did was quite a downer. So I'm going to try and keep it a little light. And actually just not waste any time and go right into Rick's interview. He's a fascinating guy who, at a very young age, is doing really incredible things on an international scale. What was I doing around his age? I was trying to get my film career off the ground. I was drinking way too much. I was kind of a mess. 
wasn't really contributing to the betterment of society or my fellow neighbor at all. So it's really impressive what Rick is doing. And I hope you enjoy this interview. I'm trying to follow you around. You're in school right now? Yes. Where you're, in, you're at Harvard? Yeah, the Kennedy yeah. School. Okay, and what are you doing a, at the Kennedy School? Yes, yeah. so, you know, doing public policy. Yeah, mm. and you have, what, a, a year left in that? A little less. A little uh, less than a year. next May. Oh, yeah? Congratulations. Mm. Thank you. Public policy, when I was in college, you, you went for graphic design and, yes. and, <laughs> <laughs> and, his, and history. And <laughs> I think you can do, these days you can study whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, you want to influence processes possibly laws yeah and what are you aiming at specifically i mean i i'm assuming it's mental health right yeah 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 it's definitely mental health um what i'm mostly passionate about is to see how local partners local structures can actually come up with their own ideas um implement what they think is the, is the right way forward implement locally feasible solutions implement stuff they have been already doing and just like, you know, partner with more institutions on the ground and then shape the policy around these activities instead of saying, oh, okay, I'm sitting in Accra, I'm sitting in Nairobi, let's make a policy right. removed from what's happening in the field. And I think this is why I'm also aiming to be a doctor because once you lose the contact with the patients, you kind of, you know, lose the contact with what's happening in reality and then you just become a Ex bad policymaker. I guess. Explain that. So... What we see oftentimes, and I only give one example, there are many variations, I guess. When you go to the ministry, you have a certain type of, you know, psychiatrist or policymaker, I guess, who has a certain mindset. Mm -hmm. You know, either they are psychiatrists, they are psychologists, they have been trained. Uh, and this happens not only in Ghana or Kenya, this happens in Germany and the U.S. as well. But this mindset, I mean, ministries recruit people what, who kind of fit into the already existing ministry scheme. Mm -hmm. However, that being said, it doesn't necessarily mean that the policies they make are, you know, holistic or are kind of, you know, seeing the reality on the ground. Because apart from the conventional view, for example, about mental health, there's a huge chunk, especially in Ghana and Kenya, with non-conventional healers. Mm -hmm. and so now... So you need to find policy that kind of that doesn't trample over their their religious approaches yeah. to things because without judging it, it's still very much... Uh, I watched the documentary again last night yeah. and I could tell that, that when they spoke of witchcraft, mm -hmm. they spoke about it still. I mean, you know, there were some people that talked about it with, you, you know, we've, we've kind of moved past this, mm -hmm. but it's, it's still very much a strong belief in the area and uh and i want to get to this later to disregard it would be uh you know just another example of old school colonialism let's just go in there and and disregard their culture and yes. get them on board with with us yes and what's interesting about this question is you know on one hand i think the way forward is to work with the communities to see what resources they have what they want to do what they think the solution is so this is a way where you can really have a bottom-up approach and then you can draft policies. i give you an example. In Kenya currently, the health is devolved to the counties. And uh, it's only Makuani County close to Nairobi and Kisumu County where I work. These two counties now have a mental health secretariat and are on their way to draft their own mental health policy. The way the mental health policy is drafted, and this is how I come in because I give technical assistance to the government, is we are not sitting at the desk removed from what's happening on the ground, but the way we are drafting the mental health policy is a year-long process. We have started with mapping out the mental health ecosystem just to know who are the players, apart from the obvious ones, the government hospitals, the private hospitals. But what about NGOs? What about traditional healers? What about spiritual leaders? We know these players have a big stake in mental health. Moving on from this mapping, we start with focus group discussions on the village level. Like there are 35 villages or like in Kenya, they call them wards. But like we're moving from these wards to focus group discussions on the sub-county level, then we move to the county level. And eventually, the whole aim of this exercise is to come up with a theory of change, mm -hmm. which is very specific to Kusumu County and not 
potentially not specific to Nairobi County or not specific to Makwani County or any other county. But eventually, based on this theory of change, you will be able to draft a Kisumu-specific mental health bill instead of doing it the other way around, saying, okay, let's draft a mental health bill and then let's see you know, how people implement and it. And install it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there there is so much you know at play at the same time, right? I mean, the obvious one is like mental health policies. Mm-hmm. Um where you say, okay, the US, is it funding mental health policies or is it not funding mental health policies? The UK, what about Germany? And um, if you look at the funding situation, it seems like it's mostly the UK, for example, funding in countries like Kenya, like mental health in Kenya or Ghana, not so much the US, not so much Germany. So this is the first interesting question, right? Like what's happening here? Like why are there only a few players, international players, mm-hmm. funding mental health? And why, the, why specifically the UK? Why specifically the UK, right? And like what we see is like there is kind of a relationship between how active the discourse in your own country is about mental health. And the UK is exceptionally good. Like with the royal family, they have a mental health foundation with the, you know, um, what, what are their names? Harry and William? I guess the yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not. A, I'm not a royal expert, but yeah. yeah. So neither, um, neither am I. <laughs> I was hoping to get yeah, chime in no, your expertise no, here. No, no. <laughs> Both of them are, to some extent, suffering from a mental health condition, you know, right? Based on their personal experiences, and so the the discourse about mental health in the UK is just is just a big thing, mm-hmm. especially compared to Germany or the US. The US, obviously, there's also a lot of discourse, but like more so on a let's talk level, not so on a, you know, let's do it level. Right. What's interesting about this, though, is now, if the UK government, and this is what, what for example, what we see in Ghana, is funding most of the activities, uh, mental health activities in the country. Now, what is the incentive for the government from Ghana to also start funding health policies or mental health policies? Mm -hmm. There's no incentive at all. Mm -hmm. And so this is concerning. And this not only happens with mental health, but then, for example, you look at what the U.S. funds or Germany funds. They fund HIV, they fund tuberculosis, they fund malaria. Again, there's no incentive for the government to step in and fund mental health policies at all. What's interesting about it is that the Guinean government, if you talk to people, they will tell you right away, when we fund health projects, we will not going to win the next election. And this is mostly because people who are voting for the politicians want to see immediate change. But especially mental health policies, they're not causing an immediate change. If someone is affected by a mental health condition who has been untreated for years and years and years, then this person is not going to recover within a year, within two years, within a feasible time frame, four to five years, whenever the next election is. And so this is why governments say, no, let's not spend money on It's a long these game and, and right. And we Yeah. We're we're very short sighted right now. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what's what's interesting about it, to bring it back to, to your original question about, you know, how to mediate between conventional healers and non conventional healers, these terms per se are kind of arbitrary. Like what do we consider to be conventional? Is the Westernized standard to be conventional? Or if I work in Ghana and Kenya, is the traditional standard to be conventional? That's a very good question. But like, you know, let's let, let's just say there are there are two groups of people, like conventional, non conventional without assigning right. the groups. What's interesting about it is now, if you listen to the government in, in Kenya, to the central government, they will tell you, okay, you know, one way of how we can implement mental health and like make sure people go to the hospital mm-hmm. is we make traditional healers illegal. Mm-hmm. And that's certainly something you can do with a policy background, right? I mean, if you do policies, you can make them illegal. However, what will happen is they will go underground Right. Now their activities cannot be regulated anymore. Mm-hmm. Two, you cannot strip them off of their social value systems. Mm-hmm. I mean, they have grown up in this society. And one of the reasons why people don't go to the hospital in the first place is because they don't consider mental health to be a condition which needs treatment in a hospital setting. So this policy is not going to help at all because people, even if they have a mental health condition, you take away the traditional healers, they wouldn't have anyone to go to because they don't think hospitals are the way to go. Right. So from this aspect, it becomes clear that we cannot only, you know, do policies removed at an office desk, but we actually need to be in the communities to understand what's happening and why. Right. And so the I same mean, is in the U.S., I guess. If, if you if you come in with your own policy and yeah. just run rampant over a community's core beliefs. Yeah. I mean, 
you might have just messed up that area for decades to come because, yeah. you know, the stories will pass down to the next generation. Oh, you know, we've we've had mental health services come here before and it was a mess. Yeah. You know, right. I mean, you could if you screw this up. Yeah. And not listen to them or not take in their side. I mean, you could you could really jeopardize having future services there for a long, long time. Right. And I think this not only happens from a from an outside perspective, like what happens if I come in and mm -hmm. implement these policies, which we don't anyway. But, you know, the question is also what happens if the government does the same, the local government, the national government, but not so much with the aim of helping people, right. but more so with the aim of one receiving international funds. Mm -hmm. For example, like if you send a human rights uh, declaration and then, you know, you want funding from outside and you don't fulfill your human rights requirements, people will say as long as conditional, as long as you not take care of your human rights, we will not give you the funding. So they do something for the sake of doing something, but not because they buy into it. But even if they buy into it and they do something, it doesn't necessarily mean that the government in Nairobi, you know, implements what is found most useful in the counties. Does the government of Nairobi necessary of Kenya necessarily have an incentive to do something which is considered to be okay in the counties? No, mm -hmm. because they want to be reelected and they do stuff in the counties where they think they get the most votes. But if you want to be cynical, you can say they don't care about you know counties where they know they are going to lose anyway. Right. And I think the same happens in the U.S. Right. I mean, you make your policies attractive to the people you think. You tailor your policies, you know, specifically to the people you think who will vote for you or mm -hmm. potentially might want to vote for you. You're not tailoring it to people mm -hmm. who are already lost and like you know you cannot vote for them. I have a far more cynical uh, answer to that, <laughs> but yes, you, the way you said it is the way it's supposed to be done. Yes, yes. that's the nice way. Uh, yeah. uh, let's let's give the audience a bit of exposition here. So in Germany, you started a group called, and correct me, it's called On The Move EV? Yes. Yes. And what On The Move EV did was that you went to two locations. You went to Ghana and Kenya. Mm -hmm. Did you bring mental health resources there or were you trying to get an on the ground assessment of what the situations were in those two areas? Yes. So we started with the mental health assessment primarily because I was doing some of my medical internships in Ghana and in Kenya. Mm -hmm. So the way how I got into mental health in Ghana and Kenya at the first place was by working with my attending at the hospital. I actually went there four times by now. I went to Ghana more often, but like I worked with this attending for four times. And at some point I realized we never ever see people with mental health conditions. And this was just not possible. So eventually I was asking him, and you have to know this attending was kind of very caring. You know, he even paid the hospital bills for some of his patients. He bought medication. He was the founder of the hospital. And so when I asked him this question, like, why do we never ever see people with mental health conditions? His answer was along the lines, they don't deserve treatment. And so it was back in 2012 when he gave me this answer. Thankfully, at the same time, he was kind of, you know, just telling me, if you want to learn about mental health, you can just go to Accra, the capital city, and like, you know, go to one of the mental health hospitals. And Ghana only has three mental health hospitals. So it was like, you know, one out of three. When I went there, you know, I don't want to, sh you know, sound or make it sound like an efficiency perspective, but it's just like human rights abuses, like people being locked away, people chained up, people being chemically and uh, mechanically restrained, sometimes even tortured to death. And in their own urine and feces. And this is like, you know, what the station is all about. I did not go back and say, oh, we need to do X, Y, Z, because I just didn't know what's happening. At the same time, in 2012, Ghana passed the Mental Health Act, which is basically, if you look at the history of mental health policy in Ghana, it's very progressive and like forward. Mm -hmm. uh, the law is very good. And yet, you know, the way how it came into existence was, you know, there was some influence from WHO, international NGOs, local NGOs receiving funding from outside. So I want to stop you real quick. Yeah. The NGOs, non-governmental organizations. Uh, organizations, what are, are they philanthropists? Are these people with money that are emotionally in, invested? Is this a question I should not be asking? Like, like, what are they? So in the mental health ecosystem in Ghana, like most of the NGOs you see, and there are actually only two or three who are doing mental health work. Mm -hmm came into existence through the support of DFID, 
which is the UK Agency for International Development. Okay. They receive most of their funding from DFID even up to date. And it's also DFID that funds most of the mental health activities in Ghana. That being said, you know, there's an external factor here which needs to be considered. However, what's really, you know, compelling about them is that they are made up of patients with lived experiences. Um, That's what I was looking for. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, there are some patients with lived experiences. There are medical professionals. Mm -hmm. You know, whoever wants to engage in the mental health field is obviously mm -hmm. welcome to join. Mm -hmm. But now it's impressive. The Mental Health Society Ghana has about 3,500 to 4,000 people with lived experiences, and they're organized. The, the downside is that they're not operating in the whole country. The downside is also, you know, that their modules don't necessarily you know, apply to, to the, the counties or districts where they don't work mm -hmm. in. Well, if I read correctly, you have one specialist for every 100,000 people. I mean, this is not something that can go countrywide yet yeah. when they can barely even make a dent in their own area. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so now the, now the question is, you know, I mean, an obvious solution is, okay, let's train more psychiatrists. Mm -hmm. Let's train more mental health nurses. And this is like the reflex you see when, when you talk with people on the ground or international stakeholders. And yet I do believe this is not fully reflecting, you know, what people want and what the system can handle. Mm -hmm. And so to answer your question, it's like, no, we didn't go there and say, okay, here are our five solutions to your mental health problem. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, as an international NGO, we even considered to go to Ghana or Kenya. It was, for us at the beginning, it was a decision, a deliberate decision we made, but like, we had a lot of discussions with our local partners if we should go or not, because what is an international NGO doing in Ghana? Mm -hmm. Eventually, we saw, and this happened because I was talking to a lot of people and like understanding the mental health ecosystem in Keto South District quite well, that there are a lot of people with good ideas, but you know they are kind of not connected, not working together. And so what's happening is like they were kind of like individual people. What we really wanted to do as an NGO is to strengthen the civil society engagement and the civil society stakeholders within the field of mental health. Our aim is not to then say, okay, once you are strengthened, here are the policies you need to implement. But our aim is to strengthen them up to a significant threshold where we basically say, okay, now, you know, we see there is a civil society engagement. Now, if they decide they don't want to have mental health care, that's one decision we have to respect. If they decide to want to have mental health care, then what is the way forward? They tell us, we are happy to provide technical assistance, but mm -hmm. we are not the ones who are saying, okay, you need X, Y, Z. They come up with their own ideas. Mm -hmm. And this happened in Ghana and in Kenya. Like in Ghana, last year was a patient advisory board which started. We had an NGO starting. In Kenya, we have now a network of 25 NGOs mm -hmm. within six counties operating on the issues of mental health. And they are doing their own work. We are only giving technical assistance. Mm -hmm. And basically, this is very counterintuitive to what NGOs do. Because, you know, NGOs always step in when the government fails. Mm -hmm. But, like, for us, it's like we're kind of doing the same. You know, we're stepping into a power vacuum. No one takes care of those who are, you know, abused or the people who are mentally challenged like and have these negative impacts in their lives. But only up to a point where we make ourselves redundant. Mm -hmm. And then we are happy to leave. Right. And most of the NGOs are not happy to leave. Right. They are making local partners depending on them. Mm -hmm. And I think... This is something, you know, what we see in the NGO space over and over and over again, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Not only in the NGO space, uh, space also in the developing right. space. What was the name of, I, I ask because I, I'm embarrassed to say I don't know how to pronounce it. Yeah. What was the name of the documentary? Obongo Edano. Okay. And is yes. that available to watch online anywhere? Yeah. It's yeah. on YouTube. It's on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Could you send us the YouTube link and could we put it in the show notes maybe so people can watch it? Yeah. I watched it last year mm -hmm. when you came here and did a presentation. I watched it again last night. One thing that I liked is that you specifically took an educational approach to it and you started with the brain. Mm -hmm. And... You went to schools, but you also went and spoke to what I understand were religious leaders mm -hmm. and respected, you know, respected leaders in the communities to talk about the brain. Yeah. And you did this thing is a very simple but effective approach is that you 
you put a sticker on the wall mm-hmm. and you made them touch their nose and touch the sticker, touch the nose, touch the sticker. Right. And then you had them put on a pair of glasses that shifted their view yeah. and then had them do it again and they were unable to do it. Mm-hmm. And it was to illustrate that, hey, I just played a trick on your brain. You know, it's, it's, right. it's, a, very, it's a very simple example, but I see how it's a way to get in the door yes. and around that mental illness isn't, you know, it, yes. it doesn't mean that your God is angry at you or you're cursed or something like that. It's just a, a trick of the brain. It was very, very smart. And from the point of view of the video, mm-hmm. it looked like it was effective. Did you find that to be effective all the time? Or where did people accuse you of, us- of using some sort of magic trick or... Right, right. So I should say there are many different educational approaches you can take okay, to that raise, was just the one that, that was shown in the documentary. Right, 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 right. And in general, I think like, you know, we, we focus on the brain, as you said. Yeah. I think, you know, we had, had a reason why we did. And I will just explain this in a minute. But like in general, I, I think if you want to create awareness, there are so many ways right. how you can create awareness about mental health. I mean, McLean is taking one approach, mm-hmm. then other NGOs in the U.S. are taking a different approach. In fact, in Germany, we are taking a different approach uh, to, to raise awareness. So I think, you know, we, we are kind of adjusting it to the cultural context. Again, with, with the approach we take, it is not us telling people, you know, about mental health, but actually they come up with their own answers and mm-hmm. solutions. So the reason why we decide to talk about the brain rather than about mental health is because there is a generic interest about the brain, how it works, how you can be more productive, how you can handle stress. So just by numbers and just by, you know, kind of looking at curiosity and thirst for knowledge, if we compare it, these these two options, people would always go to the brain talk and they would mm-hmm. never ever go to like a talk about mental health. Again, because people don't consider mental health to be a medical issue. Mm-hmm. So why would they come to a medical talk about mental right. health? When you talk about the brain, we, you know, one of the things we do, as you described, was, you know, about plasticity and flexibility and the learning brain. So people understand, oh, our brain, the way it is, it's not set in stone. We can actually change it, which for most of the people is like an insight they never had, you know, they think once they are born, the brain is just pretty much what it is, and you cannot really shape it. And that's, that's the first, you know, kind of important message, people learn and understand, I guess. What's also interesting about it is that, for example, we talk about neuroanatomy, and we we make them understand the brain has different parts, some of them make you see, some of them make you hear, some of them make you move. And then people out of the sudden start asking questions around, for example, hallucinations. They say, okay, you just tell me the brain makes you see or the brain makes you hear. Now, there's someone in our community who's looking around all the time and he or she is pretending that he or she is seeing things which we cannot see or the same with hearing things. Now, is this a brain sickness? And then, yes, you can say, you know, we call it hallucinations, but you don't need to say this because that's not what they care about. But what they care about is the fact that the brain, just as any other organ, is susceptible to disease. And again, like, you know, this is like fitting into our overall NGO approach. We are not giving the answers, but we are giving information. And then people deduce the answers from the information. It's also interesting about this model. And I think, you know, we are well aware with the modules, we don't want to biologize mental health because, yes, there is a huge... You, you do or you don't? We don't. Don't. Okay. Don't. I did a lot of research with Daphne Holt here in Boston on issues of imaging genetics and uh, emotional learning and with college students and so on. And I, I'm a big believer in the biology of mental illness. And yet, like, when we go... To countries like Ghana and Kenya, I think it's very important to acknowledge that we have to look at mental illness not only through a medical lens, but more so through a cultural sensitive mm-hmm. lens, anthropological lens, so you have to. and so on, right? You have to. And so these modules help us on one hand to make people understand there's an organ in your body which is susceptible to disease. If it gets sick, you need to take care of it. You know, just as when your lungs get sick, you need to go and see a doctor. When your stomach gets sick, you go and need to see a doctor. So do the same when the brain gets sick. On the other hand, we are well aware we don't want to overstress the bi- biological model where we say, okay, mental health is only like a biological you know, pathology. So if you seek care, you know, then you will be fine because this approach will disappoint people eventually. And obviously this is not what we are going for. But I think what we are trying to do is like we are adding 
a different perspective apart from the spiritual perspective, the traditional perspective. You know, you saw this in a documentary. People say it's running in my blood. It's my grandmother who did something wrong. <sighs> yeah, they they actually said that you know it's in the blood yeah like, like, like not even as, as a symbolic statement they, they believe that there is something physical in the blood now yep. you know there is even a, a western idea that it can be passed down biologically right. however i i think their definition of, was very literal yeah you know there's a demon in the blood yeah. that gets passed down yeah exactly and so i think you know we are trying to integrate the medical information with the information people right. already have. And let's say you have 100 people, you know, probably 10 of them say what you tell me, the medical perspective, that's absolutely not true. I don't believe in it. And that's yeah. fine. If it's a spectrum, you have 10 people on the other side who say, oh, my God, this is the explanation I was waiting for. I al always knew like what people say in our communities is kind of, you know, not true, but I also didn't know what else it is. But now you gave me an explanation. And then you have like 80 people who say, okay, I was, you know, I was learning something, but I don't necessarily buy into it. it's only mm -hmm. a medical disease. But I also understand it has a huge cultural component. Mm -hmm. And like even in the US, it has a cultural component. There is nothing like a heritability of 100%. Mm -hmm. None of the mental disorders is, you know, if you have a gene, you have it or not. No, I mean, schizophrenia is the highest of 80% ish. So there's always this environmental component, this cultural component. What's also interesting is like even within one country, you can have conditions which in one part of the country are considered to be abnormal and abnormal being, you know, just pathological and some conditions to be considered, you know, normal. And in a different part of the country, you have the opposite. Mm -hmm. And so you see there's a huge cultural component to it, like people... I believe this was one of the studies from Arthur Kleinman, who is a psychiatrist and anthropologist, and I believe it was Alaska, where people after, you know, they lose someone, they laugh, they will hear the voices for weeks and weeks and weeks. And, you know, if you are not cultural sensitive, then you would say, okay, after a couple of weeks and months, this is a psychosis. Like this, these are hallucinations. If you have different symptoms in addition to hallucinations, you might be diagnosed with a psychosis. Or at least, you know, you can you have some kind of hallucinations. However, if you understand the cultural sensitive context, then you say, no, this is considered to be normal. Mm -hmm. And so I think we have to be well aware of this and we don't want to give them like the biology knowledge for them to, you know, just use this as the only uh, truth. Right. But we're just adding you, one yeah, perspective. Use this and let's not give you any context. You, yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I don't know if it was on purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is probably feeding into my, my own fears and agendas with mental illness. But there's an interview with a man in the documentary, and he mm -hmm. said, he was talking about mental illness. He, he was like, and it's growing. He's like, mm -hmm. I'm, see, I'm seeing more examples of mm -hmm. this every day. And then I'm a filmmaker who used to work in yes. documentaries, yes. so I understand how it works. And after he says that, there's a cut to some telephone yeah. lines, some telephone cables. Mm -hmm. And that could have just been an establishing shot, or it could have been because there was a point where you could see that people had cell phones mm -hmm. and the the shot of the telephone lines. I, I didn't know if it was kind of saying that maybe the pressures of industrialization yeah. and digitalization of our, of cultures. Yeah. You know, what's interesting about it is I, I currently am taking one of the, the classes at the School of Public Health and it's called um, Foundations of Global Mental Health. Yeah. And recently we not only had lecture about, you know, online, the social media, technology, right. and the influence on mental health. And obviously, you know, a lot of research is pinpointing, you know, to, yes, it increases your likelihood to some extent, but, you know, really, like, who is affected? Like, how long do you have to spend on the phone? What content do you have to see? There's, like, a lot of biases, and the mm -hmm. studies are not quite clear up to now, I guess. Again, this is a generalization which I should not make. For different diseases, there's a stronger relationship than for other diseases. But the actual lecture I wanted to talk about was one from Dr. Becker, who is working in Fiji for, mm -hmm. for many, many years now. And so basically, she is specializing on eating disorders. Mm -hmm. And what she found is that there was a rapid increase in eating disorders in Fiji once they had television. Yeah, I, right? knew, I knew you were going to say it. I <laughs> yes. knew it. And I mean, it's so obvious, right? I mean, yeah. if you see like, you know, the actors and actresses all slim. And then, you know, what's interesting about this, though, is they didn't just watch it and say, oh, we want to be slim. But what the reasoning was is like, okay, the actor made it. The actor is slim. So if I want to make it in life, I have to, have be, to be slim. slim. Yeah. 
And this is the obvious you know, explanation. And yet, I'm asking myself, I mean, yes, I, I, I buy into this, but isn't like the actual question, like why the cultural, the traditional values are not resistant enough to the influence of like westernized you know, media or to the influence of westernized ideas. Like, yes, you can say, you know, they influence you and that's fine. But like, wh why at the first place is the system not stable enough to kind of counteract these influences? And I think that's a question you, we always forget in, in this context. And I see the same in Kenya where people just say, yeah, there is a relationship. We need to stop it. But where exactly does this relationship come from? And like, is it really applicable? Like, and what, you know, what's happening with the traditional uh, value system. I have a theory. Yeah, that relates specifically to television or movies. As a as a filmmaker myself, mm -hmm. I think the language of cinema, mm -hmm. the mise en scene, the combination of music yes. and editing mm -hmm. and cinematography. I mean, people are going to find this ridiculous, but if, when you when you've studied it as long as I have, right. and you look at it as a language, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. a very powerful language. Right. It's very influential. Right. And I believe it can cut through a lot of things. Right. Which I buy into. This study I want to see then, though, is, you know, okay, you show this in Fiji. Mm -hmm. Now show this, like, in two or three other cultures. Sure. And, like, s let's see if, they ha if it has the same effect. And at the same time, you can measure, like, mm -hmm. strength well, of traditional system. And I really love this idea because, as you're right, right? I mean... But the thing is, is that advertisers know we would localize it for that area. So right. instead of using whatever's the hit song here yeah. in America, they would use a type of music that's specific to that area. Yeah. Yeah. They would use color schemes and expensive clothes that are related to that area. Yeah. You know, you always localize it. Yeah. And interestingly, though, this is what happened in the second wave. But in the first wave, it was only the whatever was shown in the U.S. It was shown in Fiji. Oh, right. And this is so interesting because, like, why are people so vulnerable to like you know tv shows which are coming from the u.s right and so i think this would be just an interesting thing to study and like you know this is like again you know you have a good idea like and dr becker's research is fantastic i'm just like thinking you know about the applications about it in ghana and in kenya like if we study the same now what do we make out of it and like again like looking at the strength of traditional belief systems and value system is just so important. Right. Not only in terms of, you know, mental health, but, you know, obviously also in terms of democracy and policy and, like, you know, the, the role of traditional, like, the kings and the queens and the, the chiefs and the elderly. I mean, just, like, it's just super interesting to look at this, like, intersection between policy, health, and then the well-being of the community, I guess. Maybe even if it's the visual language of cinema film tv even though uh, it may come from outside cultural influences yeah maybe the message of your life will be better with this approach yeah or your life will be better with this product is universal maybe, maybe right. it is yeah or maybe it's just advertising in general just the onslaught of right. advertisement yeah yeah I mean, it's, it's super interesting you know and again like this question applies to this is a very specific you know, context I gave, but then again, like, how do you even want with all the social media now, what's happening in the social media forums? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, how can you kind of understand what's really going on? Like, is it really affecting your brain? And like, to what extent? And like, it's really yeah. challenging. It's like, I think it's in the US, I mean, it's that's, even more challenging. Right. That's the discussion right now with 4chan, 8chan, uh, yeah. uh, Reddit, all of those forums is yeah. that what what is happening when you leave people who have similar backgrounds and similar values, I guess, what happens when you let them build their own quiet societies, quiet to us, because yeah. we don't know what's going on, yeah. on these boards? Yeah. yeah, exactly. And why are we suddenly surprised when we find out that some of them might be rooted in violence and yeah. hate? And right. But then the question is, is it because of the social media they use or is it because they are now operating in silos and like cutting ties with the existing value system or in, in the society system I guess I've always thought that we got to go back to the core word the internet or net or yeah. networking yeah you know yeah. there's one person in Burbank California mm -hmm. who may have these beliefs in hate mm -hmm. but nobody around them does yeah but then they find somebody in Massachusetts. Yeah, Massachusetts. <laughs> now yep. there's two. Yeah. And between the two of them, they might find somebody in Arizona. Right. And then and then all of a sudden there's twenty. Yeah. Twenty? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. And this takes You can do a lot with twenty. 
Absolutely. And what's interesting about it, you know, it takes life from reality mm -hmm. to a different reality. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's just like very interesting to see is the same happening now in Nairobi or in Kisumu or in Accra already? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, are people mostly using phones to just communicate? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not sure. I haven't studied it. And I don't right. want to make any uneducated guesses or generalizations. Right. But like, you know, it's definitely one of the questions we encounter over and over again. And yet, on the other side, we also have to say technology is just helpful in terms of there is like one NGO in Ghana called MindIT, where you can, you know, they send you a brief survey, five questions. It's free text messaging where you kind of like, you know, answer five questions of the PHQ-9, which is, you know, just a questionnaire mm -hmm. where you screen for symptoms. And then they call you back and they hook you up with like a, a service provider in your region if, mm -hmm. if there is someone. Right. So, I mean, obviously there are advantages or disadvantages. And like, you know, in Ghana, like in Keto South District, for example, or in Kenya, in Kisumu, we're still figuring out, you know, with our local partners, like what is the right, you know, approach to using technology or to think about technology. Right. Yeah. I want to back way up. Yep. You, you're you're a young guy, you know. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're you're, you're a young guy. Ish. You're you're <laughs> you're trying to have an effect on two different coasts in Africa. Mm -hmm. I mean, why you? Don't you just want to stay home and get drunk and play video games like <laughs> like, like, like everybody else? I mean, you're yeah. you're doing. Um, you're doing a, a hard, difficult, amazing work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So where does this come from? Yeah, so um, the I would, I would like slightly rephrase the question. Like, it's not why me, but why we? Uh, like, you know, there's my NGO, there are local partners. and what? We... Yeah, but we need, we need to talk about you here. <laughs> We're interviewing you. That's true. What yeah, really young gives, man. <laughs> you know. What really gives me a lot of, like, you know, motivation, inspiration are two things. One... Like some of my friends from Ghana, for example, I've originally met them in the mental health setting and I've seen, you know, them developing over the last couple of years. We have been working in Ghana and they are, one of them is now a nurse. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is now a teacher. Mm -hmm. So that's, that, these are amazing stories and they're mm -hmm. inspirational. And I think, you know, you can say, okay, you're doing all this work, but really what's happening mm -hmm. is like, you know, I'm a part of a team of network, as you just mm -hmm. said. And this is, you know, we are all having the, a similar mission. Mm -hmm. And this is just very inspirational. Especially, I love to work with young, talented people. Mm -hmm. And they are all over the places where we work, in Germany, in the US, in Ghana, and Kenya. And it's just, I'm incredibly thankful for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. Why me also is like, I just have an interest in global mental health. You know, as right, but where did that come from, Rick? You the global up, mental health interest. Yeah, where you grew up in Germany. Where, yeah. where, where, where is this drive? Yeah. To reach, uh, you you could have stayed in Germany. That's true. Yeah. But now you're tackling Africa. It's true. So originally it began when I was in high school. I kind of thought like, oh, my my town is kind of too small. I want to move on. What so town did you grow up in? Hoyerswerda. It's okay. a very small town in, in Saxony, like the state where Dresden is also the capital of, but very removed mm -hmm. kind of rural. I mean, not rural. I mean, it has like 40,000 people by gotcha. now. Gotcha. Anyway, so at some point I was like, okay, I want to move on. I moved to Dresden, which has about, you know, 600,000, about the size of Boston. I was very happy for the first two, three years. And... I was still happy to stay there, but I was like, okay, I'm missing something, you know, like some stimulation, some inspiration. So eventually I decided to go to Boston for my medical research. Mm -hmm. And up to date, Boston is just my favorite city because there's nothing you can not do here in Boston. There's always, you know, some talks you can go to, people you can talk to. And that being said, you know, I don't want to keep myself too busy or I don't want to distract myself, but I just, you know, the inspiration I, you know, kind of can give to some of my partners in Ghana and Kenya. Sometimes I get the inspiration myself from just being in Boston, from being abroad. So eventually I also started traveling more. You went to Ghana. I'm smiling mentioned. because I find Boston to be the, I love it here. I grew yeah, up around it. Yeah. I, I find this to be like one of the craziest cities. It's true. <laughs> Crazy in its own way, I yeah, guess. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why I'm smiling. I'm not, I'm not laughing at you. It's <laughs> just like uh, <laughs> yep. different people. You know? I know. I know. Very different people. Um, 
So yeah, eventually I started traveling. I just love being in different, you know, cultural settings. I always stay with local people. I get to know the culture. I learn the language now in Ghana, like one of the languages at least. And this just makes me happy on one end because I'm just learning, constantly learning, and I'm stimulated. <laughs> on the other hand, it's because, you know, I just get a lot of inspiration from talking to people, traveling. <laughs> Our modules in Ghana and Kenya, you know, they now have a network between the two of them. They inspire each other. I can take, you know, things we do in Ghana to Kenya and vice versa. I can take them to Germany. So now I think by now I'm a German by passport and I really, f you know, I'm German no matter what and I feel German, but I also feel just home in the world. I just mm -hmm. love to travel. That's great. And this just happened through my medical internships mm -hmm. and being abroad. That's great. Yeah. So. So the world has, well, actually all different areas of the world, they have their own specific view on mental health. And you've seen how it's viewed in certain areas of Africa, be it Ghana or Kenya. What, mm -hmm. are, what are the differences? And is there anything that's similar? So... Yes, I think I, by no means, I'm an expert, you know, in, in the mental health in the world. So as you said, I would need to focus on Germany, US, Ghana, right. and Kenya, where I have most of my experiences. I think that there's a similarity, and obviously there's a varying degree, but like people don't necessarily understand mental health as something they need to take care of at the first place. Uh, if something at all, there's firefighting. But, you know, people don't necessarily understand they are always every single day, every hour, every minute on the spectrum mm -hmm. between mental health and mental illness. And I think that that's very, that's very interesting, you know, that people just, you know, don't have this understanding and like don't take care. And like, how would you or why would you take care of your mental health if you don't understand that something you, you have? What's interesting, though, one of the differences is that what we see in Ghana and Kenya, oftentimes people don't come, you know, you cannot take the DS or the SED10 or the DSM5 uh, and say, okay, here are my 10 boxes I need to check to diagnose. Because oftentimes people present with somatic symptoms rather than with, you know, the, the other symptoms, the, the ones we use here in the US. For example, if someone comes with a depression in Ghana, and I think this is very similar to um, not necessarily in terms of depression, but like in terms of mental illness, how it, how it presents itself in, in China, there's a lot of like somatization. People would come and say, oh, I can't sleep. I have like muscle ache, I have pain, headache, and that's it. They wouldn't say I feel sad and like they wouldn't fulfill any of the criteria. And so if you are not trained, you wouldn't necessarily be able to pick these up. And I think this is one of the, the main differences, the way like mental health diagnoses manifest themselves. And again, like, you know, people not only don't believe that mental health is, is a condition which needs to be treated in a hospital, but, you know, just these symptoms per se wouldn't make you go to a hospital just you have muscle ache. I mean, this is also contributing. And if you go to the hospital, the first thing which you would do in, a, in, this kind of set, in these kind of settings is to, to treat for malaria or to test for malaria mm -hmm. because these symptoms are very similar to, to malaria symptoms. So there is a difference. The, the, you know, it's less obvious in Ghana and in Kenya than it is, for example, here in the U.S. and Germany. And I think, you know, this is one of the main differences I can see. Mm -hmm. And obviously... You know, yes, mental health, there's a similarity, has a huge cultural aspect mm -hmm. in all societies. Right. The cultural aspect is definitely extended in Ghana and in Kenya by a more profound traditional belief system and spiritual belief system. Mm -hmm. Explanations you wouldn't necessarily find here in the U.S. or in Germany. No one, I shouldn't say no one, but like almost no one would tell you here in, 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 in the U.S. or in Germany, oh, it's something which is caused by witchcraft. Right. You find it, and no matter what. Right. Uh, people might be psychotic to tell you, but like they wouldn't believe per se that this is only witchcraft causing it. Mm -hmm. One thing that I did find similar in the documentary mm -hmm. is that you were uh, interviewing a mother of uh, who, whose son yeah. suffered from mental illness, and yeah. this is kind of getting to my next question, is that the stigma is the same Mm -hmm. kind of all across the board. Stigma kind of seems universal. She yeah. talked about how, you know, because of her son, her neighbors shunned her. Yep. You know, she lacked friends. Yep. The stigma of, of mental illness yep. is is uh, a universal language, which Absolutely right. brings me to, you were walking through Logan Airport yeah. <laughs> a few years ago. Yeah. And you saw our deconstructing stigma, mm -hmm. the big, what would you call it? 
Exhibition? Yeah, exhibition. That's the word I was looking for. <laughs> <laughs> you like them. <laughs> Our big DS exhibition. And from there, you th- you thought to reach out to us. That's true. And that's how we got connected. Yeah. And then how did that connection, how did that flourish to our involvement yeah. in deconstructing Sigma's involvement with Ghana and Kenya? Yeah. So let me start by saying stigma can be viewed through many different lenses. There's a psychological lens, sociology lens, and so on, right? And stigma always has a function. It's not, we not only need to look at the person who is stigmatized, but also at the person who stigmatizes. And oftentimes you see it's a power a power game. It's a power play. Sure. Um, and you oftentimes see if you stigmatize people, this is, you know, one way of taking away benefits. Like mm-hmm. if you say... Well, this actually, pr- why, it's, it's why the world is stigmatizing poor Greta right mm-hmm. now for having um uh, what is she she has a- a- ADHD yeah yeah i mean that f- the first thing out the bat yeah. to discredit her yeah. is that she suffers from ADHD exactly. so we shouldn't listen to her exactly yeah. yeah and this happens you know this happens in public this happens more privately and this happens certainly in policies like you know a lot of countries up to now s- just stigmatize against people with mental illness not necessarily for the sake of stigmatizing, but also for the sake of, you know, cutting their ability to access social policy benefits. And actually, this is an idea which goes back to the colonial past. Like Ghana in 1888 had the Lunatic Act uh, imposed by the British colonialists. Now, what happened is it institutionalized care and it also made, you know, mental health illegal to some extent. So people were thrown into a jail, but they were not thrown into a jail for treatment, but they were thrown into a jail because they, British colonialists, wanted to make sure they have, you know, public safety and order. Mm -hmm. And so the reason for stigmatizing is also to help create public order and safety. Mm -hmm. And the reason to treat people, if something at all, was not to help people and to make the society mentally healthier or like healthier, physically healthier. But the reason why the colonialists did it was to make sure that people can work on their business so that the colonialists can exploit and extract a lot of like uh, resources. And so that's, you know, just like in terms mm-hmm. of stigma. And I think, you know, there are different reasons why people stigmatize, but that's definitely a story we have to keep in mind. Right. Now, when I came back from, I don't even know, I think San Francisco and I saw the deconstructing stigma exhibition at Boston Logan Airport, I was very interested in just, you know, one, the, the way the numbers were presented, they were lining up with like kind of quotes from, you know, some, I guess, famous people, mm-hmm. like some people had to say something about mental health, which mm-hmm. is good. And most importantly, about patients, because mm-hmm. I think this is the most powerful testimonial you can get if you have people with lived experiences. And I, to myself, was thinking this, this is such a cool thing to do in Ghana and Kenya as well not only for the sake of creating awareness and giving people who have been stigmatized and, you know, who have been unheard for many years, decades and centuries to give them a voice in society. But also what I really think it's interesting about deconstructing stigma is that it has the potential. If we collect stories from many different countries, from many different continents, eventually we might be able to go back and see like, you know, how people tell the stories, like what they tell, how they tell it, why they tell it, and then just, you know, start making comparison. And not like saying we can, you know, deduct any meaningful interventions from it, where we say, okay, this is the way how people, you know, stigmatize in a few sub-Saharan West African countries versus this is like how people stigmatize in Latin America versus people in Australia. But I'm just like thinking to myself, you know, how powerful it could be to read stories from all over the world and see that there is a lot, of, there are a lot of similarities, there are differences, and where do these differences come from? And why are the similarities the same? So what we did in Ghana and Kenya was also, we collected patient stories, uh, mostly in Kito South District, and in Kisumu County, we are displaying them in public now. But the idea would be to extend this exhibition, you know, to a few more districts and counties in Ghana mm-hmm. and Kenya to get a full picture and understand what's going on from a patient perspective. So when you brought DS to Ghana and Kenya, there was still an issue with people were participating, but mm-hmm. they didn't want their actual names used, right? Right. So... I think, you know, this kind of tells us two stories. Like one, from a way how deconstructing stigma was set up, you know, we obviously 
we're talking to patients that care gave us, they had to sign, they had to understand the risk and benefits. But we're also talking to government structures and to NGO structures and to human rights offices just to make sure, you know, we are doing the right thing, cultural sensitive thing. What's interesting, though, is that we got a lot of backlash from an institution which you would expect you would not get any backlash from, which is the Mental Health Authority. Um, <laughs> And the guy who was in charge for the region... It's a, it's a great name to get backlash from, is the Mental Health yes. Authority. I mean, just, just the name... I mean, you know, I don't want to bring it down to names, but just the name authority tells you, like, yeah. what they do. Yeah. Instead of, like, it could be mental health leadership. Right. But not. let's not get into this now. Yeah, right. Um, I'm also writing one of my papers this semester about this, so if you're interested, I'm happy yes, to share it with please you do. at the end of the semester. Please. But anyway, so the guy was basically... We were explaining the concept... Patients were happy, caregivers were happy, medical professionals were happy, everyone was happy, even the Human Rights Commission with the mm -hmm. way we are setting it up. But this guy who was in charge for the region was saying that he does not want patients to show their face because the people don't have any insight. They don't have any capacity to make decisions. Once they have a mental illness, they have a mental illness for their life. And so they don't have any legal capacity. And this shocked me. This wow. is a guy who is in charge for the mental health authority, for this district, this is how he thinks about his own clients. That being said, we couldn't show the the faces of of the of the uh, patients. In in Kenya, we actually, you know, people were more open about it, and they right. we we let you know we left the decision to them, and we said, if you want to show your face, that's great. If you don't want to show your face, that's okay too. But yeah, so because of the stigma, you know, some people decided to not show their face. And in Ghana and in Kenya, we actually were only able to use initials and not like any identifying information because of the stigma. Like as much as people and patients are ready to contribute to the social change, they also don't want to suffer right. uh, and be the ones, you know, who experience negative consequences because of participating. So, you know, while we have to be respectful, you know, we also really appreciate their willingness to make a social change happening. And the stigma out there, it, it doesn't just stay within the realms of mental health conditions. It all like a, a brain injury mm -hmm. could be d stigmatized. Yeah. A brain condition could be stigmatized. Yeah. Cerebral palsy could be yeah. stigmatized. It's all out there. It's all under the same umbrella. It's all under the same umbrella. Epilepsy is the same. What's really interesting is, like, if you think about this from a more, you know, for example, witchcraft point of view, mm -hmm. or like the, the one of the mod models of explanation, I guess, whatever people perceive or they see, like mental illness can be visible, but oftentimes it's not visible at all. Mm. So as soon as someone is starting to have an epileptic attack or, you know, uh, cerebral palsy, right. they have like some, you know, body movements which are not expected. And mm -hmm. it really looks from the outside like... Possession. The witch, but yes, exactly. Yeah. The witch is now in the body and like causing these symptoms. And the same with yeah. mental illness. And this is why they fall under the same category. And in fact, like in Ghana, they're epilepsy is treated by mental health care providers mm -hmm. and it comes with the same stigma than you know any other mental illness right. so from what i understand patients that are treated at on the move ev some of them also end up working there mm -hmm. at the clinic yes and how does that further their development not only with their own treatment mm -hmm. but maybe by how they maybe share their experiences or try and destigmatize the issue, you know, with their family or communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think like all our activities, we basically do prevention, we do treatment, we do rehabilitation. All our activities aim to empower the patients to get a voice in society. And mm -hmm. part of it was the deconstructing stigma campaign, but like part of it is also patients joining us and actually leading the awareness campaign, the so brain awareness you saw in the documentary, patients are also now doing it, sharing their own stories. The treatment part, patients are also doing active case search now. The rehabilitation part, we have a clinic called Home of Brains, where basically we offer vocational training. As part of the vocational training, we employ people, we pay for the medication up to, you know, probably six months. It really depends on the severity and like how long someone has to stay. But the idea is after the six months, people are able to go back into real life and, you know, find a job, be able to take care of themselves financially and so on. 
this financial independence now gives most of the patients, first of all, the opportunity to also engage in mental health activities in the district. And this per se, which means like, you know, they go into communities, they can talk, gives them some kind of meaning and purpose in life. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, after having been silenced for years and years and years, now they can contribute to this like cause of mm -hmm. like educating society. At the same time, what happened at Homer Brains is that one of our patients, who is also now like the nurse that I was talking about before, uh, he is actually now working as a nurse at Homer Brains two days a week as a nurse, and then on the weekends he is still there to just you know entertain kids and like you know educate about the brain and whatnot. But he also organizes the patient advisory board and self help groups in the district. And out of a sudden, like people you know come together, talk about their experiences, talk about you know, even simple things like side effects. I mean, it's not simple, but like, you know, something people could not have talked about with anyone before. And this, again, per se, just a self-help group, the, this feeling like I can make a change, I can, you know, do something for my community, I can help people who are affected, gives a lot of people sense and purpose in life. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting is that even here in, not just Boston, but even here in the States, people are even put off by the word yeah. Mental health. Yeah. You know, they won't an attend an event. Mm -hmm. the, the word mental health, you know, the word wellness, yeah. you know, the hot word right now, <laughs> which is an, another umbrella term yeah. for could be yoga for crying out loud. But mm -hmm. that seems to be the same issue yeah. in Ghana, Kenya. It seems to be an issue everywhere. What is it about yeah. how we word things? Yeah. I think that, you know, Mental illness, when you say, let's talk about mental illness, right. already kind of applies, you have a disability. Sure. It's about disease versus illness experience, right? Disease is just like pathology and illness experience, really, what is the personal experience of an illness? And like if you say wellness, that's the opposite. You don't do wellness because you feel ill, but you do wellness to take good care of yourself and to, you know, do something good for you. I mean, obviously, that's one of the things I think which can contribute. A second thing is like in terms of how you perceive illness, like your your explanations of health and illness will contribute. There in Ghana and in Kenya, as well as in, you know, people in the United States, we see mental health is not an issue one talks about because mm -hmm. your upbringing kind of, you know, told you not to talk about private issues. Mm -hmm. Opening up, talking about mental illness is a very private issue. So people hold back no matter where they are. They right. have, you know, just this experience. This is not something we can talk about. And this might happen, you know, in, in, in some families which, you know, have more rigid family structures, traditional belief systems more than in others. And obviously it also kind of depends on like, you know, how many people are affected? Are you personally affected? How many people in your environment are affected? Mm -hmm. Have you had any experience with treatment? You know, it, oh, it will help you too understand, you know, that mental illness is just one other form of illness. Right. And yet I want to say, I think one of the reasons in the US also why we see differences are related to structural violence. Like people who systematically don't have access to healthcare services, again, don't necessarily, you know, come to something which they didn't have access before because they say, the system failed me for the longest time. Now, why should I right. go to something well, that the system is now offering? And like talking about that's sexual a fantastic violence, point. <laughs> even in the Boston area, you think that like Boston is, is, is a great city. You have Mass General Hospital, you have McLean Hospital, you have all the partners hospital, you have all the research institutions. But the life expectancy between certain parts of Boston, like Back Bay, mostly white people, is about 90 years. Mm -hmm. Life expectancy in parts of Boston where you have a lot of people of color is about 60 years. There's a difference of 30 years in life expectancy, and a lot of it is related, not all of it, but a lot of it is related to structural violence. Mm -hmm. And structural violence meaning that people are systematically denied access to healthcare services. Mm -hmm. If you're denied access to healthcare services, you're also, you also don't want to go to like mental health care services. Uh, especially so. mental health, right, yeah. where it's so stigmatized. Yeah, and I'm not entirely sure about the interaction between structural violence, the privacy part we just talked about, the wellness versus the illness aspect and the disability aspect, you know, perceiving illness as a disability. But I think, you know, these are at least a few of the, of the things where people are more likely to show up when you talk about wellness in comparison to, let's talk about mental illness. Right. But I'm happy to learn more about this one as well. Before we wrap up this very, very dense episode, <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, uh, is there anything 
else we should talk about? I think like one of the things I'm really curious about and really interested in is looking at the the scalability of mental health policies, uh, like or mental health in general. And I think you know the if, scalability. Yes. Yeah, so. Like, let me go back to Ghana and Kenya. Sure. When we look at, like, one district, and let's say we talk about malaria uh-huh. medication or, like, malaria diagnostics. You have one district with 100 people today. Tomorrow you want to do two districts. Right. So if you need, you know, 10 test kits one day and you say, okay, district two also has 100 people. And, like, let's say then we need about 20 yeah, for yeah, two yeah. districts. It's an easy fix. Mm-hmm. It's a technical fix. You only need money to buy these test kits. However, with mental illness, it is not as easy. You cannot just say, okay, this policy works here or like this medication works here. Now let's let's apply this here because, again, it has this cultural aspect. Sure. So I'm really wondering about, you know, like what is it about the scalability? Like how can we scale up mental health policies? And we are working on it. We are, I think what my NGO is trying to do at this, uh, at this point is like to come up with a handbook which really lines out cross-cultural strategies, how to improve mental health activities in a district, in a community, without increasing dependency on foreign stakeholders. Mm -hmm. But obviously, I'm super interested, you know, to hear from people who have done similar work, you know, who have scaled up mental health projects in a meaningful way, where they really still see impact and like, it's still cultural sensitive. So if that's something, you know, listeners of the podcast are willing to share, I'm more than happy to learn about this. Mm -hmm. So, Rick, before we wrap up, if you don't mind, just just a, a tiny piece of unasked advice. Mm-hmm. You're doing a lot of great work out there. My only recommendation is, you know, take a day off here and there from saving the world <laughs> and, and eat a pizza and play a video game and take a mental health day Absolutely. for yourself. Okay. Absolutely. So that so that we can look at the long game here yes. and you don't and you don't burn out so early. So take a mental health day for yourself. And seriously, that's not to mock you. You're doing I know, I know. amazing work. <laughs> I'd hate to see you burn out. Absolutely. No, I mean every Wednesday night I'm singing in a choir. Uh-huh. That's my mental health time. Yeah. Uh, I love to sing concerts. I love to go to operas. So there's a lot of these things happening as well. That's um, good. And it just, you know, very much in, with talking with people. And this is happening every single day. I mean, I think what you're saying is so valuable mm-hmm. because, you know, oftentimes you just get lost and you got just got sucked into the system. Mm-hmm. But, like, it's so important to also understand, you know, your own mental health comes first and then you can only take care of other people. Absolutely. So I really appreciate your <laughs> advice. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. Thank you, too. Have a good day. Yeah, you... This is what we say in Ghana. Uh, have a good day. To show off a little bit with my new okay, language walk, skills. Walk me through it. Keke. Wait, go ahead. Keke. Keke. Nenyo. Nenyo. Keke nenyo. You say yo. Yo. Keke nenyo. That's it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. All right. What did you think? Of that, Rick is a really great guy. He needs to learn how to rest. (laughs) He works a little too hard. Thanks to those who have been uh, reaching out and rating us and sending us feedback. I really appreciate it. We're starting to plan something for the one-year anniversary. I don't know. Gears are turning. Discussions are about to happen. I'll let you guys know when we've got something in the books. A lot of talk of the Joker movie and mental illness. Uh, I've seen it. And yeah, I have a lot to say. I have a lot to say. I don't think now's a good time. I think we're actually going to try and make it an an actual episode about it. We'll see. I don't know. I think the peak of the discussion around the film has happened already. And it's starting to get a little quiet. So I think we might wait for the home video release in a few months. But I don't know. We'll see. I liked it. I'll say that. I liked it quite a bit. I was surprised. Uh, This is all I'll say about it right now. I do not think it is the call to violence that everybody claims it is. And I absolutely do not think it demonizes mental illness. I mean, the film's not subtle. But I think it says some real dark truths about it. Uh, Let me clarify not things that I necessarily agree with but I certainly empathized with 
you know, you can empathize with a mentally ill person that does bad things. I'm not saying you can sympathize with them, but you can empathize. It's not a dangerous thing to do. It has no bearing on you as a person. Understanding what somebody's going through is no grounds to judge yourself or judge anybody else on. It's no different than uh, the film that Patty Jenkins made in the early 2000s called Monster with Charlize Theron about, I can't remember the woman's name, um, starts with an A, Eileen Wuornos. I totally understood why she became the person that she did. Now we're talking about a comic book villain, but still, I understood why. Nothing wrong with understanding. There's nothing wrong with it. Two weeks? Two weeks? Two weeks? We've been late on a few. We're working on that. But two weeks. Two weeks. Thank you for listening to Mindful Things, the official podcast of McLean Hospital. Please subscribe to us and rate us on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you have any suggestions for special topics or future guests, email us at mindfulthings at mclean.org. And don't forget, mental health is everyone's responsibility. If you or a loved one are in crisis, the Samaritans are available 24 hours a day at 877-870-4673. Again, that's 877-870-4673.